guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tiho. Before we go straight into today's case, I do want to give a warning that this case does talk about sexual assault and incest. I don't go into too much detail about the both of them, but if that's not something that you're interested in hearing about, then I don't think that this video is for you, but I will link um, some of my videos up here or up here I'm not sure which one um yeah and you can check those out or you can just wait for my next upload for today's case we're going all the way to Hrikfastad in the northern Cape on the 6th of April 2012 around 7 p.m a white Isuzu bikey pulled up in front of the Hrikfastad police station a young boy jumped out ran inside the police station fell to his knees and he started screaming you must come they've been shot they're all dead the young boy was 15-year-old Don Stiengamp and he was referring to his parents as well as his younger sister. One of the officers who was at the police station went to him and like picked him up from the ground and this is when he noticed that Don was covered in blood. He had blood all over his hands, his shirt as well as his legs. So he decided to pull him outside to the courtyard just so that he could ask him what he was talking about. And this is when Don explained that whilst they were at home earlier that evening, his parents and sister were inside watching TV and he went outside to the barn which is right next door the house and he went there to go fix a light and then he started hearing gunfire and he decided to hide and once the gunfire stopped he went outside went into the house to go see what was going on and this is when he noticed that both of his parents and sister had been shot but at the time his sister was still alive so he went to his sister and held her in his arms until she eventually passed away. Police officers then hurried to their car so they could get to the farm to go see what Don was talking about and he really wanted to come along with them but the police officers told him to stay behind at the police station. So he was left with two warrant officers. Colonel Dick Duval would later be the investigating officer for this case and for the rest of the video I'm either going to refer to him as Colonel Duval or just Duval and not Colonel Dick or like he's just first name because... Yeah. When Duval got to the police station, he heard that Don had been taken across the street to the only restaurant in Hrikfastad and he was surrounded by community members and extended family because he had been through something traumatic. So they were just giving him something to eat and drink and just trying to comfort him and calm him down. So Duval asked the warrant officers who were left with Don if um, they had taken a statement or taken like any photographs of Don and they would and then they told him that they weren't instructed to do anything so they just let him go but they did mention that when Don came in he was drenched in blood. So after this Duval went across the street to the restaurant to try and talk to Don and the extended family were a bit hesitant to let Don go because for them he had been through something traumatic that night and they just didn't want to traumatize him anymore but after some convincing they did let him go back to the police station with Duval and Duval noticed that all the blood that um, the warrant officers said that Don was drenched in um, wasn't there anymore. Like you could still see that there was blood, but it wasn't as much as when he came in. It would later emerge that one of the warrant officers saw Don washing his hands and legs by the nearby tap at the police station, but he didn't tell him to stop because he just felt really bad for him. And like, I think he was just like, just a little bit scared to approach him and trigger him or anything like that. So once they got to the police station, um, photographs were taken of Don as well as um, scrapings under his fingernails. And they did notice that he had a large scratch on his neck so they took a photo of that as well. After this Duval left Don with his um, dad's cousin and then told them to return to the station the next day. So the police officers went to one of five farms that Dion Stiengamp owned who was Don's father and they mostly farmed sheep but they did have like horse on the property for recreational purposes and the house was really huge so it was on a big piece of land because obviously it was a farm and they lived in the main house and next to the house was a barn and just close 
like further down on the property close to the road was where the workers stayed and they lived in their own little houses. The first officer on the scene went straight into the house. He first checked if there were any intruders and then afterwards he went to the three victims and he then confirmed that all three of them were deceased. Dion Stienkamp's neighbor, Joe Schwartz, was the community representative. And this was because um, there were a lot of farm murders attacks happening in that community, the province, and like just South Africa as a whole. So they tasked him with being like their representative in case something happened. So he could just go through everything and I don't know, I think just like take notes and things like that and also just help investigate as well so as soon as he got into the house he walked straight to the kitchen and this is when he saw all three bodies lying in close proximity dion and crystal his wife were laying on their stomachs and they both had significant amount of blood covering their bodies and you could see that both of them had been shot in their upper bodies dion was wearing a blue rugby short was wearing blue rugby shorts and a navy blue shirt that had the word South Africa printed on the back and a green jacket was laying near his head and you could see at the back of his head he had two clear bullet holes and yeah he had basically been shot execution style. Their daughter Marcella had also been shot and her face was swollen, it was bruised, it was bloodied. She was wearing a green shirt and shorts and her body faced her mother's and it would later be reported that Marcella's face was so badly beaten that she was unrecognizable. As police officers searched the crime scene, they went to Dawn's room and on the floor they found a bloody t-shirt underneath a towel and the top of it had been torn. Because Joe had studied a lot of farm murders and he had seen a lot of like photographs and videos, once he got to the Stienkamp's home, his first thought was that this isn't a normal farm murder. And he had three reasons why he believed this. The first one is that the Stienkamp's owned four dogs. And usually in like farm attacks or farm murders, the dogs are the first ones to be attacked. So they usually poison them um, just so that the dogs don't attack them or they don't make a noise and alert their owners. The second thing is once you got into the house, one of the safes was open, like wide open, and you could see all the firearms inside of it as well as ammunition and none of them had been touched. And the third reason why is because there was no obvious signs of forced entry. So who were the Stienkamps? The first one was Dion Stienkamp and he was 44 years old. He came from a long line of farmers um, in his family and because of this he inherited some of the land and assets and I'm assuming some of these would go to his son Don after Dion retired. Dion was like a very large figure in the community. He coached the under 18 boys and girls teams in tent pegging, which is a popular equestrian sport. And he was the only boy of three children and he had two older sisters. He was a deacon at the local church. He served on the church's financial committee and he was part of the local farmers union. And apparently in school, he did really well and he was once head boy of his school. His wife, Crystal, on the other hand, was 43 years old and she was said to be an extremely hard worker and she was described as a very loving and caring mother. Just like her husband, she also played a very active role in the church and a few months before her death, she started um, a biscuit business where she made and sold some biscuits to the community and she was also a gardener. Their only daughter, Marcella, was 14 years old and she was said to be very beautiful and she was very popular in school and had a very bubbly personality. And she was often seen as a golden child. She was well-rounded, intelligent and kind. 
the Stian Gump family in general was said to be a very good family and um, no one in the community had any problems with them or thought anything bad of them. Dion, I'm sorry, I mean Don and his sister Marthella um, both attended boarding school. They attended two different boarding schools. Um, Marthella went to an all-girls one and Don went to Grey College in Bloemfontein, which is an all-boys boarding school. Um, and they would come home most weekends and during the holidays. The next day, Don arrived at the police station, just like Duval had asked him to the previous night. And after this, they went to the hospital just so that they could take note of his injuries and take photographs as well. After this, they were on their way to the house. I'm not too sure why, maybe to get some of Don's things. And Duval remembers as they were driving, um, Don was very like happy. He didn't seem like someone who had just lost both of his parents and sister. He was very chatty and he said that the night before, he had driven his dad's car really fast. And then all of a sudden, without anyone having asked him anything or said anything, he asked like what he needs to do in order for him to get the inheritance. Don's extended family immediately got him a legal representative and in his parents' will, um, it was said that in the case of their death, both their children, Marthella and Don, would go stay with one of their neighbours and a former school principal, his name was Paul Borda, and he would be their guardian. But um, Paul denied this request he said that it would be a disgrace to his family to bring this boy into his home i'm not too sure why he said that but he just didn't want to um take care of don and after this he's pegging his pegging coach his name was benny hark he eventually took um, guardianship over Don and a lot of people found it a bit strange because when Dion was alive him and Benny were said to not really like get along they weren't friends or anything so a lot of people just found it very strange that he um, would be Don's guardian and even though his extended family like they were all like told him that he could come and stay with them he just opted against it and he wanted to stay with Benny and he did. News about this case spread like wildfire and everyone's first thought was that it was a farm murder or one of the farm attacks that have happened frequently um, and then police officers gave a press statement and in the statement they said that they weren't looking at any suspects yet and they were just looking at the evidence as well as interviewing some witnesses and immediately the media and the community just like took this as them not like they took this as this case not being like a normal farm murder and they thought that it was something else so rumors started spreading that maybe Dion had killed his wife and daughter and then killed himself in a like murder suicide type thing and another rumor that was going around that was maybe Marthella was part of some satanic rituals and because of that um, her family like her and her parents had been killed during Easter weekend. So I didn't mention that this case happened during Easter weekend which is why the which is why Don and Marthella were also home. The bodies were taken to a forensic pathologist so that an autopsy could be performed on all three bodies and it was determined that three it was determined that two different firearms were used in the ordeal. Dion had received three bullet wounds, um, one in his right shoulder, and um, one in the back of his head, and one behind his right ear. And he also appeared to have blunt force trauma to his head. His wife, Crystal, had been shot twice, once in the back and once in the back of her head. Marthella, on the other hand, had... She had the worst of it. She had been shot four times twice in her chest and twice in her face and the shots to her face um were likely done after she had already died 
and she had received a severe beating in addition to the gunshot wounds and it is believed that these were done by the back of the gun that was used. It was discovered that Marcella had been sexually assaulted before her murder and the recent injury had reopened an older healed sexually injury. So it was then determined that Marcella had been raped on more than one occasion. After the murders, Dawn did return back to school, which was great college, as I mentioned earlier. And before the murders, he was said to be like a very quiet boy. He was an introvert. Um, he really didn't talk much, didn't have a lot of friends. But after the murders, he literally did a whole 180. He was loud. He was arrogant you know he just spoke a lot and he didn't seem like the same person which was also a bit odd because um you would think that after your parents and your sister have been brutally murdered that maybe i don't really like you'd be more quiet more reserved more to yourself you know because you're grieving and not like you wouldn't think that she'd be like more open and like cocky and arrogant you know Don insisted on competing in one of the 10 pagan competitions, even though some people like said like, you know, he didn't have to, like they would understand, but he really insisted on participating and he wanted to use his sister's horse as well. And there were some photographers there just to like take pictures of the whole event and competition and they did notice that Don like was very cheery like he would pose for the pic like for the cameras and stuff and yeah they just thought I don't know just a little bit odd you know Police were in no rush to release any information that they had and they kept saying that they can't name the suspect or anything like that and after this people started pointing their fingers at Don and they started saying that maybe Don was adopted and that the night of the murders he found out and in a rage he decided to kill his parents for keeping the secret as well as his sister and Miss Don was still going to school and the parents started hearing like all these rumors and they started complaining saying that they don't want their children to attend the same classes as Don and then the school then asked Don to leave but his guardian, Benny, as well as his extended family, fought this and they kept saying that, you know what, no suspects have been named. He hasn't been named a suspect in this. You literally have no leg to stand on. Like, they literally didn't. So they were just like, you can't do that. And after much hesitation, Grey College decided um, that Don could come back to school. Four months after the murders, on the 21st of August, whilst Don was in class, he was called to the principal's office. Office. And once he got to the principal's office, he was then placed under arrest. At the same time that this was happening, police officers did have a search warrant for his dorm room as well as his room at Benny's house. And these were going on at the same time that he was being arrested. After this, they like took Don to the car, like the police van. And I'm not sure like what time this was happening, but I don't think the kids were in class because as he was walking, like all the kids, like the learners and the teachers, they were like staring at him and Don had no reaction. Like he was stone cold Like he wasn't frowning. He didn't seem angry. He didn't seem upset. He was just like, he just had no emotion just as he walked to the car. So as they got into the car, Duval started the car so they could drive to the police station and the radio was on. So as they were driving, one of the radio stations made an announcement that a 16-year-old boy had been arrested for the Steenkamp murders. And Duval remembers as he was driving, he was looking like looking at the review mirror just to see Don's reaction. And he remembers seeing Don like having like this creepy smile on his face as they made that announcement like you know he was just smiling smiling because Don was still a minor this case had to be handled differently so according to the child justice act his identity could not be revealed until he was 18 and this was also a bit 
I think it was just like a bit weird for them because everyone knew that like he was a soul survivor. He was 16 and news reporters had already been like saying his name and everything. So all of a sudden they couldn't say his name and they had to refer to him as the accused. But everyone knew who they were talking about already because obviously before he was named as a suspect, his name was already out there in like the media. At the bail hearing, Don's guardian Benny um, testified in his defense and afterwards Don's counsel also hired a private social worker just to speak on Don's state of mind and it was later discovered that this social worker was related to Benny who is Don's who was Don's guardian so that you can't do that you literally just can't do that and it was also discovered that six weeks after the murders had taken place Don's attorney informed him that he was a suspect, which means that the police officers um, fairly, like fairly early in the case already saw Don as a suspect, but they just didn't want to tell the press that. But Don knew this whole time, like those whole four months, four, three months, three, four months, he already knew that he was a suspect. And he just, you know, I, I don't know. I just think like he just didn't care, like, like I mentioned, he just had no emotion. So the bail hearing went on for two days and afterwards the magistrate said that they needed about 10 days just to go through all the findings and see whether um Don can be can like be out on bail. And they said for these 10 days he has to remain incarcerated. And this was the only time Don showed any type of emotion and he started crying. It was also said whilst he was incarcerated, um, Don had a lot of privileges. So his family would come and like drop off pillows and blankets. And Don said that um, the jail, like jail food wasn't well, like he just didn't like it. And because of this, his family would bring him like takeaways. Like he was living a good life in that jail which he wasn't supposed to be as well. A couple of weeks later, Don was granted bail and it said that he was granted bail because ever since the murders took place, he had been out and he had been like walking around freely and everything. And he also had access to firearms, which he didn't use. So they basically said that he didn't like pose any threat to society. So now we move a couple of months and it's December, it's the December holidays. And this was like a really tough time for the Stian Gums family, just because it would be like their first Christmas without Dion, Crystal, Marthella. It was just, yeah, it was just going to be, it was just tough. And apparently the year before, Don um, was invited to go to the coast, you know, just go see the beach with one of his friends and their family. But his parents said like he couldn't go. And this December... Um, after the murders happened, he sent his friend a message and he said to his friend, like, don't worry, this year we can go to the coast. No one can tell me that I can't go and I'll also have a lot of money to spend while we're there. On the 11th of March 2013, almost a year after the murders took place, Don Stienkamp's trial finally started. The prosecution had a lot of evidence against Don. The first one was the scene. As I mentioned earlier, um, there was no signs of forced entry. There was no signs of a struggle. And apparently, usually, like, in farm attacks or farm murders, the intruders would come in, like, open the drawers, trying to find, like, any jewelry or items that they can take. But... Um, this scene showed none of that. And also, all the valuables that were in the house had not been taken. TVs, radios, there were six cell phones found in the house. None of them had been taken. There were also three wallets found in the house. And one of them had 4,000 rand in cash. But that also hadn't been taken. So they were like, if this was really like intruders coming in to rob the house, like, like nothing had been taken, like literally nothing had been taken. The second thing is that Don's story didn't make sense. So Don had mentioned when he went to the police station, um, 
in April last year that his sister had died in his arms, which is why his shirt was so bloody. But then when they looked at like the shirt and all the different blood spatter and like patterns, um, it looked like more of a struggle and not him like holding on to his sister as she died in his arms. Also, Don says that as he was driving out, he could hear um, gunshots going like going on in the house. But this couldn't be true because Don said that he went into the house, saw like his parents and his sister, proceeded to go to his sister and hold like hold his sister and then leave and go to the police station but like where how would he be able to do this if the intruders were still there because obviously if he had went into the house saw his parents and his sisters and then went to the police station and then heard gunfire that means the intruders still would have been in the house so why did they like leave him and just let him like look at them and like hold them and then like let him go to the police station am i making sense i think i think i'm making sense yeah so the third thing is ballistics. So police officers did run um, a gunpowder residue like test on Don's hands as well as the two t-shirts. So the one that he had threw, the one that he had thrown, sorry, in the bushes outside the police station, and the one that they found in his bedroom. So both of his hands didn't have like tested negative for the residue, but both of his shirts tested positive. And Don says the reason why they tested positive was because earlier the day, like earlier that day of the murders, he had went out um to the dam or river to go shoot at some geese. And the last thing is that Don had no emotion. Throughout this entire case, like Don just showed no remorse, no emotion. Like he didn't seem sad. He didn't seem upset that he, like he had lost his whole family. Matter of fact, less than 24 hours after they were brutally murdered, he was asking about his inheritance and how he can get it. So throughout like throughout that whole time before he went to trial, he was just concerned. He was more concerned about the money that he would inherit than like the murders that took place. The judge found Don Steenkamp guilty on three counts of murder, one count of rape and one count of obstruction of justice. Two days before his 18th birthday, he was sentenced to 76 years in prison. The sentence, however, will be served concurrently. So essentially, Don will only serve 20 years because in our lovely country, no matter how severe the crime you commit is, if you're under 16 years old, you can't be sentenced to more than 20 years. And when Don committed this heinous crime, he was 15 years old and eight months. So he can't serve more than 20 years, even if they wanted to. So let's talk motive. The first motive is that Don was sexually assaulting his little sister. As I mentioned earlier in the video, um, it was discovered that she had been sexually assaulted um, before she had been murdered. And it also revealed that she had been sexually assaulted numerous times before that. So it is assumed that maybe um, Don was that Don was sexually assaulting her and she wanted to come forward and tell her parents. So she threatened him and said like, if he doesn't stop, he's going to tell their parents. Or maybe she did tell her parents and Don was like, no ways, this is not going to happen. And he decided to like murder all of them. So like it wouldn't come out. The second motive, um, which is also the most like everyone like, thinks is the main reason I was thinking like it's the main reason I think both of them are true but like the main reason is money so Don stood to inherit over 23 million rand from his parents estate obviously like if 
um, his sister were like were still alive, they'd have to like share it. But because he was the sole survivor, he was to inherit everything. And in the case that um, none of the children could inherit um, Dion and Crystal's estate, then the estate would go to Dion's parents so don's paternal grandparents so in this case it did so 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 don's grandfather got this estate and like don can't inherit this money because obviously he just like committed murder but his grandfather lovely grandfather decided to open like a trust and in this trust he donated the entire estate so now the money that's in this trust is under donation and not inheritance which means that when don is released which he will be released he will have access to over 23 million rand how crazy is that how crazy is that? Like you murdered both your parents and your sister and you're going to come out and you're going to be a millionaire. <sighs> there is a movie on this case. It's called Creek Fastad. So, um, I'll put the link down in the description box below if that's something you want to watch. If I'm not mistaken, it is on Showmax. And yeah, that's it for today's case. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys have any comments, please leave them down below. Um, I really want to know what you guys think about this case. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye!